Bienvenidos a Disrupt Everything, podcast series by Isla García. Reinventate a ti mismo y cambia lo que más te importa. How about stoicism in modern life? Some of you might have heard about the stoicism, right? Um, and how to be a stoic, how to apply sto the stoic learnings and lessons in, uh, in today's world. And also, you know, skepticism, which I think is another, which is another school in, in philosophy. And, um, you know, sometimes we just neglect what the past is giving to us, the story is showing us in this uh, modern world, which sometimes it might be the question and it might be the answer also. As you know, as I'm talking in English, it's because we have today uh, an international guest. And as you might know also, I'm, I'm doing an experiment. I'm, I'm trying to live 50 days as an, stoic, as an stoic in the in the actual world, in today's world. And I think today we have um, a person who can uh, bring this bring this subject, this philosophy, this work on uh, on the real surface of, of today's world and uh, explain us better how to navigate uh today a good life through stoicism in 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 2019 and, and 20 i guess and 21 too um we have today massimo pigliucci massimo thank you for being here and uh, thank you for taking the time for participating in disrupt everything podcast series oh it's a pleasure to be here um massimo is a doctorate he has a doctorate in genetics from the University of Ferrara, Italy, a PhD in biology from the University of Connecticut, and a PhD in philosophy of science from the University of Tennessee. He is also a fellow of the American Association from the, for the Advancement of Science and uh, of the committee, committee of uh, Skeptical Inquiry. Massimo also writes for uh, the Skeptical Inquiry on topics uh, such as climate change denial, intelligent design, pseudoscience, and, and philosophy. He has also written for philosophy now and uh, maintains, and I like because I'm a, a blog, a blog lover. He maintains a blog called Rationally Speaking. Massimo has, read, has written at least 11 books I can recall. <laughs> Some of them are making sense of evolution, Evolution, the extended synthesis, nonsense of stills, how to tell science from bong, answers for, for Aristotle, how science and philosophy can lead us to a more meaningful life, philosophy of pseudoscience, reconsidering a demarcation problem, and how to be a stoic using ancient, ancient philosophy to live a modern life. Uh, Massimo became a popular, popularizer of stoicism of and one of its driving forces in Stoicism, resurgence in the United States. In the, in the early 20, 21st century, his 20, 2015 essay for the New York Times on the topic has been one of the most shared articles up until date. Um, Massimo, it's been a long journey, right? Yeah, it's been uh, an interesting journey, let's put it that way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Massimo is also a philosophy professor of the City College of New York, um, uh, author of all these books and more than I, I don't know and I haven't read. And uh, Massimo has also appeared on TED Talks, sharing his experience about the uh, why stoicism is a great a great toolkit for the modern world. Massimo, can you can you share with us your journey? I'm gonna put it that way, from zero to stoic. <laughs> Instead <laughs> from zero to hero, from zero to stoic. <laughs> uh, that is a, that's a good question. Um, 
I should say, by the way, that uh, Arabia Stoic is actually has been translated in Spanish. So, so your listeners can actually find the Spanish oh, translation wow. of it. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna also, put the, is, I'm gonna put the, the the book in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Um, well, it's, yeah, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, I mean, in terms of personal philosophy, you know, I grew up Catholic because I, I grew up in Rome, so it's, it's obvious that, that was a, you know, the normal thing to do, basically. <laughs> Um, I left the church when I was in you know, my teenage years because I was increasingly dissatisfied with the answers that I was going to get, get from, from priests and other people about the questions that I was asking. And then for many years, I considered myself a psychohumanist um, because psychohumanism is this kind of you know, general uh, view of life that essentially says you can be a good person even without gods, that... Um, um, believes in sort of human rights and you know that sort of stuff and it's psycho humanism is, is fine but it's not really a philosophy of life it doesn't actually have uh, much of a it doesn't give you much of a guidance on how to live your life day to day it's it's really more about sort of some very general and, and, and very genetic principles and so it's kind of not it wasn't very satisfying but um i just went along with it for many years until of course midlife crisis hit when I was in my, you know, 40s. And, um, you know, a number of things, personal things happened, like a, you know, a divorce, a change of job, and you know, my father died. The kind of stuff that happens to a lot of people. Um, and uh, so nothing particularly horrible, but still something that I had to deal with and something that sort of prompted this question of, hmm, how do I think about this stuff? You know, what, what sort of guidance can I get for, for dealing with the ups and downs on, of life? That was also coincidentally the time that I started, uh, I started studying philosophy uh, seriously. So I was back into graduate school, you know, getting my, my degree in philosophy. And um, one of the first courses that I, that I took was on Plato. And it was a really interesting course. I mean, learned a lot of stuff, but that also uh, kind of introduced me to what is called virtue ethics, which is this general approach to how to live your life that was popular in, in ancient Greece and Rome, and um, that was adopted by a number of ancient schools, from uh, the Aristotelians to the Epicureans, uh, etc. Et and um, I said, huh, virtue ethics, that sounds interesting, because virtue ethics is about improving your character it's about becoming a better human being it's about paying attention to what you're doing and why you're doing it so it's like you know this this is interesting this is something that maybe i can i can work with and so i started looking into uh, virtual ethics now the first stop when you look at virtual ethics usually is aristotle and i read the nicomachean ethics which is aristotle's major work on ethics and uh, it's like yeah it was interesting but it really didn't grab me because Aristotle is a little bit of an aristocrat in that sense. He thinks that in order to have uh, you know, a flourishing life, a life that is worth living, what the Greeks call the eudaimonic life, mm. one has to not only uh, work on your character and your you know, the virtues and stuff like that, but also you have to have a little bit of money and a little bit of um, uh, you know, good health and a little bit of uh, even good looks, he says at some point. And he's like, all right, that... That excludes a lot of people um, uh, from, from the eudaimonic life. That can't be right. So I moved to the next uh, school in, within the virtual ethics sort of uh, universe, which is the Epicureans. And Epicurus has a lot of good things to say about all sorts of uh, topics. Particularly, I was struck by his treatment of um, friendship. He thought that friendship is the most important, certainly one of the most important uh, things that, that – um, mark a human life. Uh, I, I, I can relate to that. Um, he also said that we shouldn't be afraid of death because when she comes, we're not going to be there <laughs> to feel anything. That struck a chord. Um, he was not an atheist, but he clearly said that we shouldn't be afraid of the afterlife because there's no such a thing and that uh, notions of the afterlife are stories that are made up by priests and politicians who want to control us. I said, wow, this, this is really interesting. <laughs> Um, on top of which, his view, his metaphysical views were surprisingly modern, right? He was an atomist, so he thought that the universe is made of atoms that, that bump into each other in the void. It's like, all of this was really good. And then I hit the, the, the problem. Um, see, according to the Epicureans, 
the highest good in life is to live without pain, particularly emotional pain. And um, in fact, they even thought that living without pain is the highest pleasure you can possibly achieve. Well, the problem is that they also canceled, therefore, to withdraw from social and political life because, as we know, social and political life's, uh, life can be painful. And, and so why would you want to do that? And, and that didn't work with, for me because I think that uh, a human life where you don't actually, you're not involved in politics, you're not involved in politics as in you know, the, the broader sense not of caring about the polis, you know, contributing to social life, contributing to you know, making this a better world. Um, without that, I don't, I, don't think I, can, I don't think I can work with, with, with that sort of parameter. So, so much for Epicurus. So I was in that, uh, at that stage where, you know, I knew that the virtual ethic, or I had this intuition that virtual ethics was the way to go, but the two types of virtual ethics that I tried were not particularly, uh, you know, fit for me. And then one day on Twitter, of all places, um, I read this thing that says, um, help us celebrate Stoic Week. And I said, what the heck is Stoic Week? And why would anybody want to celebrate the Stoics? And, you know, I've, I read Marcus Aurelius when I was in college, and, and I even translated Seneca when I was in high school from Latin. Uh, but I never really put the, the two together, actually, uh, as, as members of a, of a unified kind of school of thought. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I, I signed up for Stoic Week. Stoic Week happens every, um, uh, every fall, usually in October or early November. And basically, it's a week during which you sort of practice, try, try out to practice Stoicism. You download a booklet which has, you know, the basics of Stoicism. It has some readings, assigned readings, and then it has some exercises, you know, some meditations and some other stuff. And um, I said, oh, let's, let's do it. And it struck a chord immediately. As soon as I started reading, especially Epictetus, who I had never heard of before, you know, this is, this is a guy who was a major philosopher, not only in his own time, in the second century, but basically throughout the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance and into the early modern period. And yet he's not taught today, even in, even in graduate school, even in philosophy of graduate school, you, don't, you never hear about Epictetus. So I heard of, of him for the first time during Stoic Week, and I, you know, I downloaded immediately his, his full, full writings, uh, the four books of the discourses and, this, and the small um, manual or, or handbook. And I just devoured the whole thing because Epictetus really spoke to me. He has a blunt uh, way of, of talking to his students. He, you know, he doesn't mince words. He's, you know, what he says is, is what, he, what, what he really means. Uh, he has an interesting sense of humor, uh, both in terms of self-deprecation, but also in, he's also somewhat sarcastic uh, towards some, some people. And so it's like, wow, this is my guy. So when I started uh, reading Epictetus, I really got in, into it. And then at the end of the week, I decided to commit to continue this practice for another couple of months until the end of the year. And then when I got to the end of the year, I committed to uh, practice for another year. And now here we are, you know, more than five years later, and we're still talking about it. And wow, what, what a journey. And what, 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 practices, what practices will you remark from all that you start following and then and the ones you follow right now? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, we have a friend of mine, Greg Lopez, we just published uh, a book here in the United States, which I believe is coming out also in a Spanish translation. Um, the book is called, uh, in, the, in the American version, it's called um, A Handbook for New Stoics. Mm. Um, and um, although the, for some bizarre reason, the, the English translation, you know, as the British translation is living like a stoic. And I think that's what's <laughs> going to be. Uh, I think the Spanish translation is going to be a, a diario stoico. Or sí, something, or viviendo como un estoico. Yeah. So something like that. And at any rate, uh, so we, we wrote this book precisely because to answer the question you just posed, which is, you know, what about exercise? What kind of exercises do stoics do? And in, in the book, we present 52. So that's a lot of, wow. <laughs> of exercises that are drawn from the writings of Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, and Seneca mostly, also from some of the other uh, minor Stoics. Um, and for each exercise, we also try to bring up to speed, things, things up to speed with modern science. So we look at the literature in cognitive science or psychology and see which one of these exercises actually seems to work based on, on modern empirical evidence. 
But if we're talking about my favorite practices, um, it's there, this is much, much smaller number. I don't do 52 exercises because that would require a lot of time. Um, people can try, readers can try those exercises uh, one by one and then see what basically what works for them and what doesn't work because stoicism is a flexible philosophy. There are some things that work for some people and other things that don't work for, the, for, for some people. So. Um, my favorite exercises are uh, one of the ones that I do pretty much every day is the so-called philosophical diary. Basically, this is inspired directly by Marcus Aurelius meditations, uh, the meditations where he, uh, his own philosophical diary, personal diary. Right. So he would. Uh, so so the, the, the way you do it is you pick a moment, usually in, in the best in the evening after dinner, but before going to bed, and so you retire in a quiet place of your house or apartment and for a few minutes you just write down your thoughts about what what happened during the day but i don't mean this as just a general diary like you know today i went to you know to, to the to the party or, or I, I i went out for ice cream something like that i mean things that are at et ethically morally salient so you know you you should go through your day and for everything that that had a moral component of some sort you should ask yourself uh, what did you do right? What did you do wrong? And what you could do better the next time? So the reason to ask yourself, what, what did you do wrong, is not to sort of indulge in regret and you know, self-flagellate or anything like that. It's just to learn from your own mistakes. Hmm. It's like, oh, okay, today I, you know, I, I answered with an angry voice to my, you know, an angry tone with one of my, one of my colleagues. Okay, that's not a good thing. So, so that's one thing that I want to, be mindful of in the future, I need to stay away from that. You also ask yourself, what is it that you did right? Because not only it's good to appreciate the stuff that you did right, but also because that's where you want to move forward. So basically those two questions, uh, what did you do wrong and what did you do right, uh, give you kind of a, a, a set references so that you, over time, you're trying to move away from the first from the things you do wrong and, and toward more and more things to do right. The third question is, you know, well, what could I do better next time? Well, that's because our lives are not actually as varied and as, you know, as, as uh, complicated as people sometimes think they are. We tend to do the same things day by day. You know, you go to work, you see the same people. Uh, you have a family, you see the same people and you interact in the similar situations. You have friends. And again, you go, you go out with them and you see them pretty much in the same situations. That means that if you pay attention to what you're doing, then um, the same situation is going to happen or a similar situation is going to happen over and over and over. And so if you're mindful of the fact that, oh, well, today I didn't react well when my colleague was you know, complaining about something, uh, then now you know that the next time that the same com uh, colleague or somebody else at work complains in a similar way, and now you're prepared. Now you are paying attention. You're, you're mindful of what's going to happen. So, so the philosophical diary is a way to do sort of self-engaging, critical self-reflection to learn from your own mistakes and prepare for the future. And, and it's a really valuable um, uh, tool. Uh, modern cognitive science uh, suggests that you do that by writing in the second person, so as, as if you were writing to a uh, a friend, right? So instead of saying, today I did this or that, uh, you write things like, today you did this or that. And the reason for that trick uh, is that it puts some distance, be you know, emotional distance between you and yourself, basically. <laughs> it's like you were talking to, to yourself as a friend. And interestingly, that's exactly what Marcus Aurelius does. Um, yeah, the meditation is, yeah, the meditation is written in the second person. Right? You keep saying, oh, you know that this or that happen so why are you doing this or that and so on so that's one um, that's one uh, exercise there are a number of others that i do on a regular basis so let me give you a couple of examples of other examples yes, um, please. one of the one of the typical exercises is what what is known as um, mild self-deprivation so these are things like taking a cold shower or fasting or abstaining from drinking alcohol or things like that for a certain period and this, this is supposed to be mild self-deprivation. You're not, you're not supposed to starve yourself to death or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's, it's just like, it means just you're, you're skipping a meal or two, or maybe you, you go 24 hours without eating, something like that. Um, and the same with alcohol. You know, 
I, I'm Italian, I'm Mediterranean. I, I, the, the notion of having dinner without a glass of wine is kind of inconceivable for me. But, <laughs> but once in a while, you know, you. Once or, yeah, exactly. But once or twice a week, you, you can do it. I mean, it's not a big deal. And now, why would you want to do that? That's the, that's the question. Uh, why would you want to impose on yourself these kind of limitations? And the reason for that is because you do it with the kinds of things that you feel that you have a problem handling correctly. So if you tend to eat too much, then fasting is a good, is a good idea. Uh, and I'm not talking in order to lose weight, although that, that may actually happen. Um, I'm talking about because you want to remind yourself that food is not, you know, this, this all-encompassing thing that unless you have it in great quantity every time, you're going to die. You're not going to die. And, and you remind yourself of that. And then you, you can remind yourself of the fact that you can easily stay without food for, you know, a meal or two. The same for alcohol. If you, if you have a tendency to drink a little too much, I'm not talking about being alcoholic. If you're an alcoholic, then you need professional help. But if you're just talking about like, you know, it would be, I realize that I drink a little bit too much, uh, you know, on, on an average uh, basis, then great. Once or, or twice a week, um, this, d- decide ahead of time that, okay, t- today, no alcohol at all. So these exercises are supposed to remind you of the fact that you can handle deprivation, that, you know, you can be just fine uh, sometimes without, without these things. It also is an exercise in reminding you just how good you normally have it, right? I mean, Seneca says, uh, at one point, he says to his friend Lucilius, you know, I went a couple of days without eating, and you wouldn't believe how wonderful was that, that soup with stale bread that I had, you know, when I, when I hmm. got back home. It's like, yeah, exactly. We, we tend to forget that we have a lot of things, good things in our life, you know, that, that we don't appreciate because we, tend, we take them for granted. So this is also, in a, in a sense, an exercise in appreciation of the, the stuff you have in life. So that's two exercises. Um, a third one that I like uh, to do on a regular basis, um, if whenever, whenever it's possible, is the sunrise meditation. Uh, so this is, uh, this is actually found in Marcus Aurelius, um, and uh, the Stoics actually got it from earlier on from, from the Pythagoreans. So this is a, a kind of meditation that is really, really, um, uh, sort of old it, it, it's like millennia old and what it is it is um hold on a second let me you know something because otherwise you're going to hear noise in the background uh-huh. so um what it is is that the sunrise meditation is you know you get up a little before sunrise you know like half an hour or so before sunrise you you get to a spot where you can see uh the sun rising if possible i mean if you live in a place where uh, where well, that's possible. Otherwise, you know, something close. I mean, I live in New York. It's not easy to see the sunrise in New York. Um, but there are a few spots where you can get pretty close. And, and then you just stay there. And you're not quiet. You, 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 you quiet for a few minutes. You just look at the sky, not directly at the sun, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just in the general <laughs> direction. And you wait because you're, otherwise you're going to go blind. And then you wait and sort of, and you, you're, you remind yourself that the, the notion here is to remind yourself that we are part of a greater cosmos. That, that, that too is a thing that we tend to forget, especially if you live in the city, um, you know, where there's a lot of stuff going on, where you sometimes don't even see stars at night because there's so many lights and things like that. So we tend to forget, we tend to get insulated and focused on our day-to-day life without, you know, sort of reminding ourselves that we actually have are living in a larger cosmos that have been going on for literally billions of years and of which this particular instant and this particular place in, in, uh, in the universe is, is a tiny, you know, really tiny, small, small one. So it's a way to remind yourself of the connectedness, the connection that you have with the cosmos and also to, to some extent to put your pro- problems in perspective. Right? You, you, we all tend to be very uh, sort of, consumed with our, with our day-to-day problems. And when you start stepping back for a minute and say, you know, no matter what happens to me today and my job or today with, you know, this or other problem, the sun is still going to rise tomorrow. It, it's still going to be there. <laughs> it's, it's like one of those things that's like hmm. relaxes you and puts things in a little bit of perspective. So, so those are three of my favorite exercises. But as I said, there's, there's many more. Thanks, Massimo, for, uh, for giving us these uh, clear, crystal clear examples. Um, what's, what's been, um, I'm, I'm, I'm te- I have to tell you that I, I'm, every night when I'm going to, to go for a hot bath, relaxing hot bath, I put some of, 
at least between one and five, between one and five uh, stoic meditations in your podcast. So, uh -huh. so yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning so much because I'm writing down what you, the reflection you said, every, every, every quote you mentioned from a, a philosopher. What's been your drive behind the book, How to Be a Stoic, and now the, the, the one you're launching, the, by the way, congratulations. Thank like, you. Uh, um, so what's, the, 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 what's been your drive behind the book and, the, and also the podcast? Well, the, the, what happened, as I said, was that, uh, you know, a few years ago that when I encountered Stoicism, it really changed my life for the better. Uh, it gave me a kind of a moral compass to navigate life. Uh, I'd become less uh, sort of irritable, um, more focused on what I was doing and more paying more attention to the good things in my life and, and trying to be, uh, to develop a, sort of an attitude of equanimity toward the bad things. And I figured, well, this, this is certainly going to be helpful to other people. And, and sh so I wrote the first book, How to Be a Stoic, um, with the intention of speaking to people who were like me a few years earlier. You know, if I would have loved to have something like How to Be a Stoic when I started out, <laughs> um, because it would have gotten me on, on the, the, the initial steps of, of that journey. It would have told me, uh, told me you know, the book tells me, what the basics are, what the history is, how to practice, what kind of problems stoicism is uh, helpful for, and you know, that sort of stuff. And so I wrote the book as if I were writing to myself in the past, essentially. Um, and the results have been what I was hoping for. I mean, I, I had no expectations in terms of, the, of how well the book would do. I had no idea. This was new to me. You know, the whole stoicism thing was, was new to me. And I'd written, as you mentioned, several other books before, but most of them were academic. Uh, not really uh, in the general public with, with a couple of exceptions. Nonsense and Tilts was an exception. So I didn't really have much of an idea of what expectation of what was going to happen. And to my surprise, the, the book has been a success. It has sold very well. But more importantly, I get constant emails and letters from people who read the book and, and tell me that their life has improved as a result, that, that they're doing better with their whatever their problems are. And that's that's something that is satisfying in and of itself. I mean, regardless of, you know, more practical things like sales of the book or anything like that. It's like when you feel like uh, your own philosophy, the philosophy you adopted for your own life is actually going to be useful to other people because of something you've written or because of something you put out, as in the case of the podcast, um, that's, that's just, it's just, just very good. It just makes you feel like you're actually helping others. Um, I love the word you used, equanimity, because... As you are so, um, first, uh, yeah, uh, first, um, thanks. I wish I could find something like how to be a stoic before and people like you, because my life also will be, will, what will, will have been so easy. And as I discovered the stoicism, so you, you are completely right. And, and I like the, the word you used, like equanimity, the yeah. word you use equanimity, because it's so similar with, uh, some of the Buddhist. Uh, teachings and you you say it yes. so in I, th I, I guess I, I don't know where I read it but you saying that the uh, stoicism and Buddhism share some uh, had some similarities and this is what you really hook you at the beginning right yes that's right they do have they share a lot of similarities when it comes to their ethics so in other words when it comes to, to how to live your life and treat other people they're very different in terms of their metaphysics i mean their their view of the world is very sure. different uh right you know buddhism has this whole thing of with karma and reincarnation um so there's nothing like that in stoicism the stoics don't believe in the survival of the of the soul after after death but nevertheless the, the important bit is that the ethics are very similar and in fact i was actually interested at some point in buddhism buddhism is something of course that you keep hearing even here in the west it's, it's very popular uh, you know, even, even here in New York, there's a major Buddhist temple. So I, I kind of thought of, uh, on and off over the years of, you know, well, maybe I should take a look into, into the Buddhist, Buddhism. And when I did, I, it was obviously interesting and obviously a, you know, a, a useful philosophy of life, but the language was alien to me. I didn't grow up with that kind of uh, culture, of course, with that kind of language, with those kind of concepts. And so it's kind of alien. It's like, eh, yeah, I know, I know what, that, what you're saying, but I'm, I'm just now feeling it. Uh, when I, 
and discovered stoicism, the thing was, as I mentioned earlier, completely, the reaction was completely different. I mean, it, it really hit it a chord immediately. And I'm sure part of that is because uh, I share the same sort of cultural background, you know, the, the classic Greek and Roman cultural background that, that Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and Seneca were writing uh, from. Um, but the two are very similar. In fact, very often I say that, um, you know, if you want to have a general idea of what Stoicism is, uh, you can think of it as the, the Western equivalent of Buddhism. No, I like the idea. I, I, used to, I always used to joke with my friends uh, saying that uh, at some point Buddha and, and uh, Seno might have uh, some beers together because it was... Yeah. <laughs> like, That's right. Yeah. But, well, you but, know, that's interesting you mentioned that because th some people have suggested a, a more direct connection, not, with, not between Buddhism and Stoicism, but between Buddhism and Greek, you know, ancient Greek philosophy. Because it turns out that Pyrrhus, who was a skeptic, uh, not, a, not a Stoic, but, you know, another one of those mm -hmm. Hellenistic schools, he was in India for several years um, mm. following Alexander the Great, because Alexander, Alexander went to India, you know, did his conquering there as well. And we know that uh, Pyrrhus learned uh, the local language and talked to Buddhist monks. Buddhism had just started at the time, it, like 200 years earlier. So it was, very, it was a very new philosophy. And um, so it's possible that there, are, there had been some cross-pollination between the two because we, we, we don't know exactly how much the Buddhist monks got from, uh, from Pyrrhus in terms of Greek philosophy, uh, or, or how much Pyrrhus got, got from, the, from, the, from the Buddhist monks. So it's possible that there was at least some uh, connection and, and inter, you know, cross-fertilization, basically. Wow. Not directly with Stoicism, but, but definitely between Buddhism and uh, uh, ancient Greek philosophy. Isn't it amazing? Uh, um, Massimo, what change, what change in behavior do you notice uh, on a students that you that, that embrace and practice stoic philosophy because you are a philosophy professor and yeah. um, also you've been teaching for a while and also the book the podcast a lot of students what's what's the change on behavior which which i think is, is pretty remarkable at least to to, to stop there and you know i think that the two the two changes that i see more often and that i've seen in myself uh, but I see also in my students as well as you know, people that write to me um, after having read the book or after listening to the podcast uh, are one, the fact that people tend to be uh, paying more attention to what they're doing and why. That's, that's kind of almost the whole point of stoicism. Um, mm -hmm. That is, instead of doing things just because or because other people tell you or because that's the normal thing to do or whatever, uh, it is. It's just, you, you're not supposed to go through life with, you know, an autopilot. You're supposed to actually be mindful, uh, thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing it and setting priorities. So that's a major change. People start paying attention, which means that they start doing uh, certain things and not others, uh, that they redirect their efforts and their time, you know, uh, because, of course, time is limited. We don't live forever. Uh, in fact, we don't know how long we're going to live. And therefore, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every, every minute is in fact precious and you really don't want to spend it. You know, one of the exercises that um, Greg and I put into this, in the book is one in which you go through a number of activities that you've done over the last few days and then you ask yourself two questions. The first one is, was this activity actually good for me? Did it improve me as a, as a human being? Did it make me a better person? And the second question is, would I do that on the last day of my life? And it's surprising the kind of things you learn once you start thinking about it that kind of in that way. I mean, I guarantee you, very few people get to the end of their life and look back and say, "Well, I wish I had spent more time on Facebook, um, right? <laughs> or, <laughs> or 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 answering emails or something like that." It's like, yeah, nah, that's, that's not that's not likely. <laughs> yeah, that's not likely. So, and, mm -hmm. and, but nevertheless, we we do spend a lot of time on social media and email and stuff like that. And why is that? Because we live, we tend to live our life in a mindless kind of way. We're just, just not paying attention. So the main, the main change that, that happens if you start practicing stories is that you're, you're paying attention. The, the, there is a technical term that the Pictetus uses, it's, it's prosoke. And prosoke literally translates as, it's often translated as mindfulness, but it, it really translates better as paying attention. So that's a big thing. The other major thing that happens to people is that they become less angry less irritable. 
uh, we, we go back to the concept of magnanimity that we were talking about a minute ago. So one of the big deals in stoicism, one of the big uh, concepts in stoicism is that you should never be angry with other people, even if they actually did do something in, unjust uh, against you, you should never get, ang get angry. And the reason you shouldn't get angry is twofold. There's, there's two reasons, really. One, because the stoic um, uh, assumption is that people don't do bad things on purpose. They do it because they don't know better. You know, no, nobody, uh, nobody goes up in the mirror in the morning and says, wah, wah, ha, what kind of bad thing can I do today? Nobody behaves like that. Only cartoon characters behave like that. Uh, people do things because they think that they're right. Uh, now, they're mistaken often, uh, but they think, they think they're right. They have reasons to do it. And so once you, you pay attention to that and you appreciate that, you, you become to be less angry with people. You say, oh, you start treating people as, as uh, you know, human beings who make mistakes as opposed to just evil um, you know, to be dismissed on, on the spot. And the second. Um, uh, sort of uh, effect of this way of looking at, at what people are doing is that, um, and the second reason you shouldn't be and you shouldn't get angry, it's a practical one because it turns out, empirically speaking, that if you act on the basis of anger, you're probably going to regret it. Even if your anger is justified, even if you're, if, you know, if you're on, in the right that those people did you know, something bad to you or something like that, if you act on the basis of anger, you're going to regret it. And the reason for that is because anger, as Seneca put it, is kind of a temporary madness. Uh, one of the definitions of anger is that it takes over reason. You, you can't reason with an angry person. I mean, try. <laughs> it's, just not, it's just not possible. It's not going to happen. And, yeah. and, right. And so the Stoics say, look, since it is not right to get angry at other people, and also if you do it, you're going to regret it because you're gonna, if you act on the basis of anger, you're going to regret it, then you need to start implementing a series of techniques to prevent your anger, or if you do get angry, to disengage. And it turns out that these techniques, which are detailed in, in, they're in really great, great detail, they're listed in, in, uh, in very great detail by Seneca in a book called On Anger, or De Ira in, Italian, in, uh, in, uh, in Latin, um, turns out that those techniques are still valid today. If you, if you check the website of the American uh, Psychological Association and check their, their uh, treatment of anger, uh, anger management, anger issues, it's pretty much Seneca. It's, it's exactly the same <laughs> kind of advice that Seneca does. Well, of course, great it, you know, psychology. You know, is really yeah, exactly. It was a great... Uh, uh, the Stoics, um, um, and, and in fact, a lot of the Greek and Romans in general, the ones that we read still today, including Epicurus or Aristotle. They were great intuitive psychologists. They, they had paid attention to the human mind and to how people behave and why they, they behave in a certain way. The reason, look, one could easily ask, you know, why the hell are we wasting our time today in, in the 21st century still reading things that were written more than 2,000 years ago? Well, there's two reasons for that. One, because these people really got some interesting insights into human behavior and human nature, which have not been surpassed yet. In fact, they've been confirmed. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of modern research, modern cognitive science actually confirms pretty much what the Stoics and the Epicureans thought about human beings. And the other reason is because human nature hasn't changed. We have definitely made advances in terms of technology, right? So the ancient Stoics were going around with, with horse and carriage, and we, we go around with, you know, airplanes and, and, and automobiles, and they certainly did not have social media and, and smartphones and things like that. But those are actually superficial differences. The similarities are much more important. We still want the same things. We're yeah. still afraid of the same things. We still have the same desires, the same, you know, we, we go after mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. stuff like money, uh, uh, obviously power. health, power, fame. Information. It's all, all the that. same stuff. Yeah, it's all the same stuff. I mean, to the point where... Uh, there are some bits in, in uh, Seneca, for instance, where it's almost comical because he's talking about a situation that could easily be applied in the 21st century. Like at some point, he writes a letter to his friend Lucilius where he says, you know, I've been bothered by all this noise that comes out from the street. I'm trying to write here and I can't concentrate because there's all these people yelling and, and, and making noise in the street. Well, he, he was describing Rome in, in the first century, but it could have easily been New York in the 21st century. It's the same thing. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've got the same kind of problems. And so that's, which is why, of course, uh, these ancient philosophies, and not just stories, but also Buddhism, 
uh, and Confucianism, for instance, if you want to draw from the Eastern tradition. That's why they're still useful. Uh, it's not, you know, we don't, we don't look at Aristotle's physics anymore. Um, and the reason for that is because our physics is far more advanced than Aristotle's. We don't look at Aristotle's biology for the same reason, because our biology is far more advanced. But we do look at ancient ethics, and the reason is because we haven't gotten that much further in ourselves. And that's it. And at least, it's, at the end, is that is what they what they what they preach is self self mastery, and the the way to to achieve it through stoicism. Yes, yes, to some extent. Although we need to be careful about what we mean by self mastery. So you know, one of the the stereotypes about the Stoics is that they uh, are trying to suppress emotions and go through life with a sort of stiff upper lip. Which is um, wrong, yeah. Yeah, that's not, that's, not, that's not quite right. I mean, there is a, just like in every stereotype, pretty much, there is a grain of truth there, right? Um, it is true that uh, endurance is a stoic value. I mean, you know, they, they did say, hey, if there is nothing you can do about a situation, then you just have to endure it. What, you know, there's, what's, what are your choices? If you start complaining about things that you cannot change, then what, what is the point? You're just going to make yourself feeling worse. Um, without actually accomplishing anything. So there is a component of endurance about things. And it's the, the thing about emotions, it is true that the Stoics were trying to uh, get away from what they call the negative emotion. They call them the passions, but uh, the term really should be negative emotions. So disruptive emotions such as anger, fear, hatred, things like that. But at the same time, they also said that we need to cultivate positive emotions, such as love and joy and a sense of justice. Right? So, so it's not that they were trying to suppress emotions as much as that they were trying to reorient their emotional spectrum, basically, away from the negative ones, away from the, from the stuff that disrupts your life, and, and embracing the positive ones, embracing the ones that are actually good for your life and for other people. And Massimo, um Th talking about the, the also the values and uh, virtue ethics, how how would you say how how to start living as a stoic? Where to start? Uh, like bi briefly, question. like uh, uh, how what was the basics yeah, to yeah, to start? Yeah, so that's a good question. I would I would say uh, two two things. I would say pick up a good modern book on stoicism. Um, obviously, you know, how to be a stoic is it's a possibility, but there are books by uh, people, uh, other authors like Don Robertson or Bill Irvine. Uh, there's a number of other books or John Sellers. Uh, there are a number of other good introductory books to stoicism. So, so pick at least one of those so that you have a sort of a general idea of what it is uh, that we're talking about and, and especially how to practice it. Um, then pick... Um, at least one of the ancient texts, because you also want to have an idea of what the, where this thing comes from. I would suggest either um, Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, of course, or Seneca's Letters to Lucilius. Those are the two more approachable uh, things. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my, my guy is Epictetus, but Epictetus is difficult to read, more difficult to read. The discourses are a little bit more uh, advanced. And, uh, and, and, I, and the manual is, is not, it's a, it's a very condensed summary. So if you don't know anything about stories, that's not a good way to start. It's a great way You can get lost way to, really easily. Yeah, exactly. It's a great way to continue once you've started, but that's not, not a good way to start. So I'd say one or two books from modern Stoics, such as myself or Don Robertson, Sellers, uh, Irvine, and one or two books from the ancient Stoics, particularly Seneca's Letters, and micro series of, uh, uh, meditations. Oh, and then join an online community uh, where you can find advice. There's a large, there's a major uh, Facebook um, uh, group on stories that is run by Don Robertson. And then there's a bunch of others that are more specific for certain um, different countries. Like I, I run one in Italian, for instance. I don't know if there is one in Spanish, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and then, uh, or, or even better, if you can, um, See if, it, if there is a local store. So see if, if there is a local group of people who practice stoicism because that getting to know people on, on a personal basis is even better. Uh, you get more direct feedback about how to practice and what to read and you know, what to do. Now, if you don't know whether there is a local group in your area, you can go to a, a stoicfellowship.org, uh, I think. Um, yeah, the, the, the name of the group is Stoic Fellowship. 
and you, you can look it up and there they have a world map basically and you can click on your area and they list all known people or groups that are interested in stoicism in that area and if you don't find one then you might want to register with the stoic fellowship and start one uh, because Not they will let idea. you know yeah that's yeah. they will let you know if somebody else is interested they'll put in touch with you thank you um do you see any massimo do you see any problem or handicap with stoicism in today's world because we always talk about the, you know, the, the shiny part, but is there any, <laughs> any handicap or any, like... Yeah. And also, you are a skeptic, so it's, it's good right. to ask you, ask you this question. Right. No, it's a good question. Uh, yes, I do see some problems, and I've actually written about it um, uh, on and off. Um, so I, I think one of the problems is the stoicism does lend itself to uh, in a certain number of misunderstandings that we, we, we talked about. Uh, you know, the stiff upper lip stuff and uh, suppressing of emotions. It is surprising to me how many people really misunderstand the philosophy and then use it incorrectly. Mm. Um, for instance, uh, the most obvious example is that there's, there's a brand of stoicism in the United States that it's called, uh, it's often referred to as Silicon Valley stoicism because it's, it's popular uh, among entrepreneurs in, in Silicon Valley, you know, computer um, people and you know, social networks people and stuff like that. And the problem with that is that those, those are people who are using stoicism in order to get rich or famous. And it's like, well, no, this is not what it is about. <laughs> um, you know, uh, for the Stoics, fame and, and wealth are what they call preferred indifference, meaning that they are preferred, um, you know, sure, if you have them, why not? But they're indifferent, meaning that they don't make you a better person. And the whole point of stoicism is to make you a better person, not to make you richer. Or, or, or more or, or famous it's, it's just to make you a better human being so there, I think there is a problem there with a, certain groups of people that are really misapplying the, the philosophy this is not surprising the same happens with Christianity there's such a thing as uh, in the United States as the prosperity gospel which these are people who profess to be Christians um, but they tell you that they use Christianity to make money which is like it's so bizarre that if, if Jesus heard something like that, it would come back and you know, you know beat him on the head. Um, <laughs> so it's like it's weird, but but it's there. It is there. And and then there are other people. You know, the same happens to Buddhism. A lot, a lot of people, for instance, use meditation to you know deal with their problems, um, uh, become more calm, or or um, manage uh, chronic pain and stuff like that that's that's great if it works I, there's no problem but just because you're meditating and that doesn't make make a buddhist a buddhist is not somebody who meditates a buddhist is somebody who actually agrees with the with the ethical precepts who who understands and accepts the full noble the four noble truths and and follows the eightfold path that is what makes a buddhist not the fact that you're meditating um and the same goes with stoicism it's like you know, you can keep a journal, a, a diary, for instance, or you can take a cold shower. But if the reason you're doing that is uh, not to improve as a person, but to impress other people, uh, you know, like if you take a cold shower and you take a selfie to post on your social media and say, hey, look how cool I am. I'm taking a cold shower. That's you're missing the point. Eh? That's just that's not good. <laughs> it's just not stoicism. And, and what will you what will you improve? Uh, what would you improve in, in the stoic philosophy and why? Oh, that's a good question. I'm actually about to finish writing a book just about that. Um, wow, interesting. It's, um, yeah, it's essentially, uh, I've, been, I've been thinking quite a bit about, about this, and there are a number of things that I think need, do need to be improved or changed, which, again, is not surprising. I mean, I, when I, whenever I say this, it's like people say, oh, what do you mean you're changing things? Well, it's, it's a philosophy that it's almost two and a half millennia old. You, you better change that's something it. because, that's you know, it. Um, and the same goes, again, this is not just for Stoicism. Buddhism is, has changed over, over the millennia. This is not, the modern Buddhism has a variety of different schools and a variety of different you know, ways of approaching things. It's not the same Buddhism that you had 2,000 years ago. The same goes with Christianity. I mean, I know that there are, such, there are some Christian so-called fundamentalists who think that they're reading the Bible uh, uh, or the Gospels literally, but there's no such a thing as a literal reading of anything. It always needs to be interpreted, particularly because uh, both the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are full of parables and stories that need to be interpreted. You can't take them literally. Literally, they don't mean anything. Uh, so you have to interpret them. And of course, interpretation changes over time. Nobody today is a Christian in the way Christians were 2,000 years ago. 
and a good and that's a good thing <laughs> right? yeah so you want need to be redesigned yeah yeah so so the same goes for stoicism i mean you know certain things need to be updated and and one of the interesting things to me about the stoics is that they themselves realized that that was the case first of all they had a lot of discussion internally to the school over centuries with people disagreeing with each other you know posidonius who was one of the middle stoics uh, disagreed with chrysippus who was one of the early stoics and you know uh, seneca says you know i'm going to do my own thing here i don't i'm not necessarily going to follow what other people say just because they said it mm-hmm. and um, so there's a tradition in stoicism of of disagreeing and and arc and and uh, changing things but my favorite uh, bit is is a, a letter from um, uh, from Seneca where he says to Lucilius look he says look our forerunners you know the people that came before us are not our masters they're just our teachers and so we can we should follow them so long as it's a good thing to follow them but if we I come up with new quote. ideas yeah if we, have, if we come up with new ideas and better ways to do things absolutely we should do that So now you ask me specifically what I, I would change. Well, one big thing that I would change is to do away with some parts of Stoic metaphysics. Um, the Stoics were pantheists, and uh, so they believed that God is the same thing as the universe. Uh, it's yeah, immanent in the one. universe, right? And it's made of it's made of stuff. It's made of the same stuff that the universe is made of. Now that's a nice poetic way of looking at things, but it literally doesn't make any sense in terms of modern <laughs> science, yeah. right? So in fact, they even thought of the universe as a living organism, and uh, you know, which which had some implications because they thought they derived a certain concept of providence, for instance, from this notion of the universe being a living organism because and the God universe is doing and, yeah. yeah the universe is doing whatever is it's best for himself for itself right as a living or as any organism would do and therefore whatever happens in the world is for the best of the universe not necessarily for your best your personal best but definitely for the best of the universe well that's a lovely idea too bad it's it's false <laughs> it doesn't you know it doesn't come out of not modern science and i'm a scientist if it doesn't go well with modern science yeah, i'm i'm afraid you need to throw it out so the question is well and what happens if you do throw it out what happens if you uh, abandon that notion of the cosmos as a living organism and therefore the notion of providence that comes out of it are you still left with stoicism i mean there's some people that have argued Uh, that if you do away with that, then you don't have stoicism anymore. That those are crucial notions within stoicism. And I'm arguing in this new book that I'm writing now that that's not the case. That there are some parts of stoic metaphysics that you can do without, and you should because they don't make any sense anymore. Um, and yet you can recover a modified version of the ethics um, that still works. And the major modification, of course, is that the ancient stoics, if you read Epictetus, for instance, in particular, The ancient Stoics uh, derived uh, sort of um, uh, a good, good feeling and a, a good, um, a good uh, general attitude toward toward life from the fact that they lived in a provid- in a providential universe, right? That things are going to work out for the best at a cosmic yeah. level again. And God right. will give you this, or will take you. Um, well, so it's different from the from the providence that the Christians are talking about, right? In the case of the Christians, uh, God really loves you directly, personally, right? And so, even though you may not realize why God is doing certain things, He's got a plan, and that plan does involve you. In the case of the Stoics, there is no plan that involves you. You are basically a a, a organ of the universe. You're kind of Epictetus mm-hmm. uses the the analogy with a foot that steps into the mud, right? And he says, you know, if you're the foot, you're not going to like stepping into the mud. Um, but because you're connected to a body and the body has to get across the street and the street is muddy, then it's up to you to get into the mud. You know, who else is going to do it? The, the head, the, 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 the hands? No, it's, it's up to the foot. Um, in that analogy, we are the foot and the universe is the body, right? So there is a sense of, uh, of you know, Uh, it's it's you feel better about what whatever is happening to you. There is there, there is a sense of, when you have this sense of providence because like well you know I'm stepping in the mud but there is a cosmic reason for it. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I don't believe that there is a cosmic reason for it. <laughs> um, it's just that you know whatever happens happens. Period. And it's not. And it happens. Yeah. Yeah. It just happens. So what are you going to do as a result as a stoic? Well, 
instead of telling yourself that whatever is happening to you, it's for the greater good of the universe, you say to yourself, well, whatever is happening to me, it's neither in my favor nor against me. It's not like the universe is... Total equanimity. Exactly. So we'll go back to equanimity. Exactly. So you develop equanimity and say, look, we live in a world where the, the universe doesn't care one way or the other. So it's not in my favor, but it's also not against me, right? It's, 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 it's completely neutral, which means that I have to accept the fact that in life, sometimes you, you win and sometimes you lose. This is just the way it works. And when you win, you'd be glad. And when you lose, you just accept it because it's part of the way the, the world actually works. So yes, developing equanimity becomes even more important, I think, for a modern stoic. And Massimo, I have like a, I have a th three questions before the rapid fire questions. So I will uh, I will ask you those questions briefly. So okay. I'll go ahead, and uh, I think the interview is super super enlightening, at least for me, and I'm sure for all the the listeners. So thank you. Uh, before before ending, um, we still a bit to go. Uh, okay, Massimo, what's what's the weirdest stoic philosopher? that has impressed you the most and why? Well, definitely Epictetus. Um, and I think that the reason for that is because of uh, the fact that he, he speaks very clearly. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it speaks plain language. You understand exactly what he's saying. And he's blunt. He doesn't mm -hmm. mince words. He's just like, he tells it, it tells it to you like, like it is. And he talks to his students. I mean, what, what we have from Epictetus are the discourses and the, and the, and the handbook. In the discourses, he talks to his, to his students uh, quite a bit. And, and he tells them pretty bluntly. He says at some point, for instance, he says, look, you guys come here and you want to study Stoicism. But then I see you out there when you go back to the city and you behave as if you haven't learned anything. So, so <laughs> why are you wasting my time? Yeah. So, so why are you wasting my time here? You're wasting your time and mine. Um, so he's, he's, he's got that kind of thing. It also has an interest, is a delightful sense of humor. I mean, one of the first things that I read from Epictetus is from the first volume of the Discourses, where uh, he says, um, uh, sure, someday I'll, I'll have to die. Well, if it is today, okay, I'll, I'll deal with that. But it doesn't look like it's going to be today, and I'm hungry, so I'd rather go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah. like this kind of no nonsense, uh, you know, sort of attitude. It's like, Very sure, clever. death, you know, death, death. We'll, we'll think about it when it comes. You know, right now we've got other things to, to, to deal with, like you know, finding a good lunch or something like that. Okay. So Epictetus is, is uh, but he's also, um, other than the sense of humor and the bluntness and, and the fact that his language is very clear, he's also it. Uh, he comes across as a genuine human being. He really comes across as somebody who believed what he was saying and was practicing what he was saying. I mean, we don't know much, unfortunately, about his life because um, one of his students, Arian, um, wrote a, a biography of Epictetus, but it, it's lost, it's, unfortunately. And so we don't know a lot of details. We only have secondary sources. But we do know that he lived a simple life. He, you know, he really uh, lived the life that he was preaching essentially to his students. Um, he never married, but then when he was uh, fairly old, he actually took a, um, the, the, the young child of a friend who would have otherwise been left exposed to die, basically. And we don't know why the, the child would have been left exposed, possibly because the family couldn't afford to raise him or, or because he had some kind of physical defect. But Epictetus uh, took the, 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 the infant and then raised him with the help of a woman we don't know whether he married the, the woman or not but it, so we have this we get this feeling that he really was a nice person who was trying to do his best um as he says himself in the in the discourse he says you know i'm not i'm not socrates but i would love to die trying to be a socrates you know when when, when death comes i would like it that that she finds me trying to be a socrates this is this somebody who is modest. beautiful yeah, yeah it's, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful phrase um, Massimo, what's what's the what's the challenge in today's society? Uh, why, where values and virtue virtue are diminished and under under undervalued? And uh, yeah, well, the the interesting thing I think is that stoicism, in a sense, is very different from um, most much of what's going on in modern society, right? So, so modern society is all about fame, uh, you know, and money and consumerism and you know which is exactly the opposite of stoicism 
Uh, and yet, as you know, and that's why we're talking about it, Stoicism is actually in the resurgence. It's becoming more popular. And not just Stoicism, but also Buddhism and also you know, a number of, of similar philosophies. And so you kind of ask yourself why. And I think the answer is, is pretty clear. There's research that shows uh, that uh, consistently over the last several decades that while people's material conditions have improved, right? You know, we, we have more wealth, we, have, we live better lives, uh, and so on and so forth, people are not more happy. The degree of happiness has stayed the same over the last several decades. So that is a paradox, right? So we, we, we tend to think in a capitalist society, in a consumerist society, we are told that what makes us happy is to have stuff, to, to buy things, to be able to afford, you know, vacations and things like that. And yet in reality, the reality is that research in psychology is pretty clear. That's not the kind of stuff that makes us happy. Uh, now, the Stoics would not have been surprised, and neither would have the Buddhists, right? And so I think that the resurgence of Stoicism, Buddhism, and similar philosophies is precisely because people are, at least some people, an increasing number of people, is, is beginning to figure out that we've been sold a bad, uh, a bad idea, uh, that this notion that uh, we need to get more and more stuff and more and more money, and then we need to be famous for five minutes a day or ten minutes a day, this is all actually empty. It's not, it's not leading anywhere. It's not making us better. Uh, and it's not making us, our lives actually better. So I think that that's a, that's a main reason why Stoicism is, is so popular these days. And Massimo, every, everyone, almost everyone talks about Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, sometimes Diogenes, or, but we forgot sometimes about Cato, Rufus, Cicero, yes. Heraclitus. Can, just, can you tell us briefly so, about the, those, sto those Stoics and, and why, why some more, and some more, and some more that we tend to ignore that uh, needs to be reminded of? Well, yeah, the, the, yeah you're yes, really right. And uh, the, the answer for why people don't talk much about those, those is because we don't have a lot, unfortunately, left uh, from their writings, right? So Musonius Rufus, who was Epictetus' teacher, actually left a few... Uh, lectures and a, and a few fragments. You know, we, you, you can read those in basically a couple of hours, <laughs> and and you're done, or even less. Uh, Hierocles left only fragments. That was he was a second century uh, Stoics. We have almost nothing of the early Stoics, like Zeno uh, of Satium, the the founder of Stoics. We basically have nothing. Only a few put quotes here and there from secondary sources. Uh, it, Chrysippus wrote a bunch of books. Not a single one has survived. We only have fragments. Uh, so there's reasons why, you know, we don't talk about those. It's because we just don't know much about them. Um, the little we do know, however, should probably be appreciated. I mean, you know, a good source for that is the Adonis Laertius um, book, The uh, Lives and Opinions of the Eminent Philosophers. Book seven of The Lives and Opinions is, is about the Stoics. And, and the Adonis tells you some interesting stories and some interesting ideas about Zeno, Chrysippus, and, and a few others. Um, now, the big exception here is Cicero, because uh, from Cicero, we actually do have a lot. Um, we, we, we have a significant amount of writing, but Cicero was not a Stoic. He was an academic skeptic. He belonged to a different uh, school, and uh, however, he was very sympathetic to Stoicism, and so he wrote a lot about Stoicism, and, and I absolutely uh, am convinced that Cicero should be appreciated in his own right, for one thing, because he was a a great writer and you know a great statesman and, and, a, and a pretty good philosopher. Um, so people should read Cicero, period, just because he's Cicero. And but also, if you're interested in Stoicism, you should read a few books by Cicero. Uh, the most important one is On the Ends of Good and Evil, uh, where in books two and three of the of that the chapters two or three basically of that book, he talks about Stoicism, um, the the Stoic Paradoxa, which is a short treaty about some unusual notions within, within Stoicism, which Cicero calls paradoxes. Um, the uh, Tasculan Disputations, which is a series of essays that he wrote uh, when he was in his villa in Tusculum and uh, outside of Rome, and it, most of them talk about Stoic philosophy and they explain a number of things about Stoic philosophy. So, so there are large, there's a large number of writings by Cicero, and, and um, I think there is a little bit of an effort, I'm certainly making a little bit of an effort on my own to have people reconsider Cicero and reread uh, Cicero, because he, he had a lot to say, uh, and he was a fascinating figure in, in mm -hmm. his own right. I mean, he lived uh, right at the end of the Republic, 
you know, surrounded by uh, these larger than life individuals like Julius Caesar, Octavian, who became the first emperor, Mark Antony, Cleopatra, uh, Pompey. And it's like, it's unbelievable the number of people that. that the kinds of people that, that Cicero interacted with uh, was, was stunning. So, so Cicero is definitely worth things on, right? Worth studying, yes. Worth studying. Yeah. Thank you yeah, for definitely for worth ex studying. extension of uh, the philosophers. And now we're going uh, heading to uh, rapid fire questions. Uh, okay. We are heading towards the, the end of the interview. Uh, Massimo, what's your favorite book? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, at this point, I would have to say um, uh, Epictetus and Caridian, Cari the, the man on the handbook. Uh, this is um, I read so many times. Yes, exactly. You know, I've recommended so many times in Spain that uh, yeah. there is in Spain is a house called Ca Casa del Libro, house book. So yes. they, they ju just call me saying, don't recommend more these books because we run out all these books, man. Uh, it's just been so <laughs> oh, that's fun. great. That's it's great. the book yes. I've recommended the most. Yes, um, that's, that's and, uh, my favorite book. What's your favorite author? Oh, that's another. That's a difficult question because you know it's hard to have one. I mean, there's there's so many. But let's say among the ones that I read re more recently, uh, then it would have to be uh, Seneca, mm. and and that's because his writing is so beautiful. He's, he's like, he, you know, if you can read Latin, that, that would be ideal because his Latin is beautiful. But even in translation, uh, in fact, I've heard a colleague, uh, colleagues um, uh, telling me that it's almost impossible to mistranslate, to translate badly Seneca because the language is so clear and so, <laughs> and so, like so beautiful that it's like, you know, you, you cannot have a bad translation of Seneca. Um, so, yeah, that would be my choice. What, what rule would you change in today's world? Huh, what rule would I change? Uh, uh, probably the, 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 the notion that we should have rules in the first place. I, I think that uh, life is too complicated to have rules um, and that we should be a little bit more flexible. In fact, that's one of the advantages of virtual ethics over the, the other kinds of uh, approaches to ethics that, are, that can be found in, in modern moral philosophy. Um, the, the other two major ones are utilitarianism, uh, the notion that we should always try to maximize people's, most people's happiness and decrease most people's pain, and the ontology, Kantian deontology, the notion that there are, in fact, universal rules, like the categorical imperative, uh, that should dictate what we do. And uh, one of the advantages of the Stoics and the other uh, schools in virtual ethics is that they realized already more than two and a half millennia ago that life is just too damn complicated for rules. So rule number one for me would be there are no rules. You just have to look at, at, at each situation and, and figure out what's the best way forward. Mm, thank you so much. And uh, what's your most valuable item right now? Um, hmm. You mean in terms of actual, you know, sort of monetary value? Or, or the one or that I care the most about? Or utilitarian, right? Yeah. Useful, um, maybe? Useful, maybe. I don't have anything that is useful that I particularly care about because, you know, useful things can be replaced. Um, but I do have a uh, Roman lamp from the second century, that is, from the time which Epictetus was, uh, was alive. It's not, it's not very valuable, meaning that it costs, you know, a few hundred dollars, but it's one of my favorite objects. I, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, it's uh, it's near near my desk, and um, it's one of those things that um, you occasionally pick up and, and think, "Wow, uh, this thing was being used by people, actual people, like almost two thousand years ago." Uh, Otherwise, and, and, we are and, studying and, right now. Yeah, yeah, and now and now we are exactly the same kind of people we're studying uh, right now, and, and now here I have it, in, you know, in my apartment in New York, uh, thousands of miles away, and two thousand years later. Continuing with the rapid fire questions, what's, it, what's your passion outside Stoicism? What's another passion for you? Writing, for sure. I mean, I spend a lot of time writing about all sorts of things. I mean, you mentioned in the beginning, um, uh, you know, I write about skepticism, modern skepticism. Uh, I write about pseudoscience. Uh, obviously, I write about general philosophy. But just writing in general, I mean, there's not a single day uh, that passes that I don't write. Not the thing. I like it. What's, what's the song you've listened to the most you, you can recall? Hmm. 
Uh, probably, um, I would say Monty Python's life, um, um, uh, the bright side of life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's the song that they sing at the end of Life of Brian, the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the one that says, you know, um, look at the bright side of things. And, and the funny thing, of course, is that when they're singing this, they're all on, on, on uh, crucifixes. They're being crucified. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> but they have their, they're singing these happy songs, like, look at the bright side of life. This is um, this is <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 really, it's a really funny song, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great group uh, of comedians anyway. What philosopher would you, you, you would like to become? If you had to choose one, which one would be your role model? Well, that would have to be Epictetus. I mean, there's, there's no I question so, about yeah. it. <laughs> your, your biggest dream, Massimo? Um, to pretty much uh, in, keep living the kind of life that I'm living now, um, surrounded by you know, good friends, good family, um, uh, loving wife, um, and in a great place like New York, doing what I love to do. Mm, precious. So I guess what, it's not a dream. It's really a reality. It's really a reality. <laughs> and uh, what's your being? What's your being? Your what's been your biggest failure? My biggest failure um, has been not to to um, uh, realize this, uh, not not to understand that there was a, a better way of doing things uh, until fairly late in my life. Right, all these changes that we talked about happened when I was in my late forties and early fifties, and I uh, wish that they somehow had happened before because um, I, I made a number of mistakes like everybody does. I mean, we're not talking about any major things here, but, but a lot of mistakes that could have been avoided. Uh, my life could have been uh, that of a you know, better human being um, had I found this, this path a few decades earlier. But then again, um, one of the stoic um, notions is that there's no sense in regretting things because you have no control mm. over the past. So the past of control. Yeah, exactly. The past is gone and there's nothing you can do about it. So there's no sense in sort of regretting things. And what's the thing you feel more, you feel uh, most proud of? My books, I suppose. And, and, and um, um, in terms of sort of what the general public can see um, and in, you know, in, terms, in, in, in personal terms, by, I guess my daughter who's growing up to be a smart and successful uh, young woman. Yeah, congratulations. And What will be your, your final message for anyone who is uh, listening to this podcast and also listening to your, your, yeah, your, your experience and learning from you? What's, what's, what will be your final well, message? This, this, this is not going to surprise you that much. Um, <laughs> I think that the, the, the final message should be that you know, some things are up to us and other things are not up to us and realizing the difference between the two and focusing on the first and, uh, and accepting the second with equanimity is the key to a good life. It makes the whole difference. Um, is there anything you'd like to add, Massimo? No, just th thank you for having me. And, uh, I'm our pleasure. Uh, where, where, where people can find you online so to know more uh, about you? My main uh, uh, presence online is on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at M P L U C C I, and uh, I also have a place uh, on uh, online, which is where, which is basically where you can find everything that I do, everything that I write, all my books, and everything everything else. And that is Massimo Pilucci, just one word, at WordPress.com. Mm -hmm. Massimo, thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom, knowledge, experience with, uh, with all the listeners and with me. Uh, we are super blessed to have you and uh, good luck with your, with your life. Uh, it's a really great example on how to, how to live a good life and also how to, it's inspiring us to, to follow this uh, new stoic path. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, it does, at least for me, uh, a lot. And I'm sure for a lot of listeners. Congratulations, and uh, we will uh, we will be we will be paying attention to your to your next launchings and uh, promoting it and put it on the show notes and you know trying to to get the spread the word out here in Spain and also in the Latin uh, community. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Bye, Massimo. Thank you so much. Bye, bye. Esto ha sido disrupt everything. Why is that Encuentra el riesgo antes de...
permite que el riesgo te encuentre a ti.